Hey guys, welcome back to Clownfish TV. This is Neon, not here with Geeky Sparkles. We're gonna talk about Dungeons and Dragons and Wizards of the Coast again, stepping in it. Kyle Brink, who's a producer uh, of uh, d d content for WotC, is uh, d doing a damage control PR apology tour. I, I don't know what you would call it. Basically, after the backlash over OGL 1.1, uh, Brink has been going out to several several YouTube channels and podcasts to talk about uh, Wizards of the Coast and all the drama associated, associated with it and trying to, I believe, cultivate uh, goodwill toward the company once again because they know that the brand is damaged. Now, it's the same apology tour that wound up being kind of a PR disaster for him because one of the first shows he was on, one of the first podcasts he was on, he basically was like, hey, white dudes can't leave the hobby soon enough. Now, again, you can argue what his intention was, but it did not sit well with a lot of D&D players because the vast majority of tabletop gamers, uh, you know, for better or worse, tend to be white dudes historically. And the guy's like, hey, I can't wait till they all you know, get out of the way. Now, I think he was talking about bringing in more diversity and more diverse voices into, um, you know, developing the games and all that. But uh, the way he said it was not phrased well. And then he went on another, or no, it was the same show, rather. And uh, he basically stuck his foot in his mouth when it came to the OGL and was kind of like, well, we don't know what was going on. We were completely innocent in all this and they should have waited. And it's like, yeah, it didn't, it didn't go very well. A lot of people are like, bullshit, Kyle. <laughs> we, we know exactly. You knew what was going on. Everybody knew what was going on. Now you're just backpedaling. And um, they basically thought that the, uh, the fans were dumb that, uh, you know, somehow Hasbro was doing an end run around wizards to do this or something. It was like, no, Dude, that's not the case. So fast forward to this weekend. And there is an interview with him again on another podcast, another YouTube channel. And they bring up Dark Sun. Now, for those of you who don't know of the uh, gloriousness, the gloriousness, is that a word? I don't know. Geeky uses it. Uh, I, like, I like it. Gloriousness of Dark Sun. Uh, it was one of my favorite campaign worlds uh, for AD&D 2nd Edition. It was basically a dystopian uh, fantasy setting. If you took Mad Max and you took D&D and you kind of smashed them together, this is what you got. And this actually came out, I think, before like World of Warcraft and, you know, when they started mashing up genres. Uh, but it was it was cool. It was really cool. And I, I like the concept of how magic worked. That it had like an ecological cost that you could cast magic, but you uh, would basically have to kill something to do it. And whether it's, you know, plant life or whatever. Uh, I love the dragon, the concept of, of there being one dragon who was, if I remember correctly, was a wizard. Um, and uh, it was just a very, very different take on D and D and they had all kinds of, you know, different uh, classes and races. And, you know, some of them, some of them apparently are problematic because, you know, it was, a very tough environment and there were slaves and uh, it was dog eat dog. And uh, I thought it was cool as hell. Um, it was actually my second figure set. I think my first set of figures, I got the Ral Partha forgotten realms set. That was my first set. And then I got the dark sun set and I got, because I love the dragon. I just thought he was really cool character. And I've been kind of waiting for them to come back and strip mine dark sun, but I'm like, no, given the way, that Wizards of the Coast is current year. I would not want them to bring back Dark Sun. They brought back Spelljammer. They brought back Dragonlance without the knowledge of the original authors, by the way. They just kind of did it and they nerfed them. And there was a whole controversy around Spelljammer and the Hadozi and all that. Well, anyway, Brink is doing this uh, apology tour, PR tour. They bring up Dark Sun and he flat out says Dark Sun is too problematic for current year Wizards of the Coast. That they can't do it because there's so many problematic elements. So we're going to talk about that because this is, again, this is another blow against classic, uh, classic TSR, classic D&D. &D. The game that Hasbro is producing now is D&D &D in name only. A lot of people moving on to other game systems, especially because of the OGL backlash. I think it's going to get worse with one D&D. &D. 
um, you know, for sure. But yeah, the fact that they're afraid to bring back Dark Sun, that that that's where we're at. And honestly, I mean, Dark Sun had some dark elements, but it wasn't any worse than stuff you'd find in comic books or manga. Um, but their audience is so overly sensitive at this point that we can't publish something like this because it's problematic. So let's let's uh, <laughs> let's throw another uh, classic campaign setting, another uh, set of authors under the wheels of the bus over at uh, Wizards. Uh, before we get into it any further, please subscribe for more pop culture news, views, and rants, guys. Over 296,000, almost 300,000. We're almost to 300,000 subs. Thank you so much for the support. We've been talking more and more about tabletop gaming lately because I'm just floored at how weird the entire scene has gotten. I'm floored at uh, you know how Tumblr culture has, has overtaken tabletop and how overly sensitive everyone has become when it used to be metal, it used to be kind of hardcore to play D and D. Uh, and, you know, we've had all these hit pieces written about OSR gamers and we've had, you know, wizards of the coast, uh, basically in a roundabout way, denigrate old school gamers and, and, you know, agree that, uh, classic D and D and AD and D were problematic. I mean, if they could throw Gary Gygax under the bus, they would absolutely do it. I think, but you can't really detach the game from the guy who helped make the game, right? Well, you can, but it's not a good look. I don't think they really care at this point. But I want to point out, too, that there are a lot of alternatives. In fact, we are working on an alternative. It's not a one-to-one D&D replacement. I don't want to do another D20 system, but uh, we are working on Adventure Engine, which is coming eventually. Eventually, we are working out some bugs right now and uh, it's probably gonna be a while but go to adventureengine.net and sign up to get notified when we're ready to go live with this when we're ready to sell it and it's gonna be pretty cool we're trying to do some things that people haven't really done in tabletop and um you know we're trying to look at it from a first-time gamer's point of view like hey if you've never played role-playing games before this is your first introduction to an rpg uh what makes sense right not what's been done before, but what makes sense. So anyway, uh, go out there, adventureengine.net, check it out. Uh, let's talk about this. So comicbook.com put this article up, and I missed it because I haven't really been paying that much attention for the last couple of weeks to uh, you know what uh, watsy has been doing. But yeah, having having uh, Kyle Brink go on this tour and throw Darks under the bus was like, what the hell? Seriously? Seriously. Uh, coming from comicbook.com, Christian Hoffer, while Wizards of the Coast is returning to several classic campaign settings, they're a bit more uh, reluctant on bringing back one popular setting. Earlier this week, D&D Executive Director Kyle Brink spoke with Bob the World Builder on his YouTube channel, continuing a series of appearances to rehabilitate D&D's image in the wake of the OGL controversy. They need to stop letting him speak because he's actually doing more damage. Uh, my personal opinion, he's actually doing more damage by going out there and sticking his foot in his mouth and uh, you know running down classic campaign settings. During the interview, Bob asked about the prospect of a Dark Sun revival. A lot of people would like to see this. Um, I think it's going to go like Pet Cemetery, but uh, a dark post-apocalyptic setting that focused on scarce resources and moral ambiguity. I freaking loved it. Uh, I'll be frank here. Well, tell you what, let's go out and listen to the clip because Bob's RPG radio clipped it. We'll listen to this. Any potential that we would see a revision or or republishing of the Dark Sun setting ever. So the ever is the operative word there. Um, Ever. Maybe forget the ever and let's just say in the next five years. So the, the, (laughs) uh, I'll be, I'll be frank here. The Dark Sun setting is problematic. I in agree. a lot yeah. of ways. Problematic. That's the main reason we haven't come back to it. We know it's got a huge yeah. fan following. Um, and we have standards today that make it extraordinarily hard to be true to the source material yeah. and also meet our our ethical and yeah. inclusion standards. So, yeah, that's totally fair point. And I think that's already yeah. kind of the consensus. I, people, I think, just wanted to hear yeah. uh, somebody say it. Um, we know there's love out there for it. And God, we would love to make those people happy. And also, we've yeah. got to be responsible. Okay. Be responsible. A, so separate, separate. Be responsible. We can't bring that campaign setting back because it might hurt people's feelings. 
Oh my God, we got to be responsible, right? Uh, Brink's answer probably isn't a surprise to many who follow Dungeons and Dragons, especially as the game tries to move past certain problematic content found in past editions. Dark Sun was a popular setting in second and fourth edition. Uh, its post-apocalyptic tone use of certain fancy archetypes and stereotypes and its heavy use of slavery as a symbol of oppression would likely need to be updated due to evolving views on how oppressive systems are depicted in games. It is a post-apocalyptic hellscape. But we have to make it kinder and gentler. <laughs> However, there are at least a few current D&D creators who are interested in attempting to modernize it. Uh, for instance, uh, Agit, Agit George, one of the design leads for last year's Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, expressed his interest in tackling a Dark Sun revival that would approach the setting as a sort of dark counterpart to the more uplifting themes of the Radiant Citadel adventures. Uh, that's not going to be Dark Sun anymore. Uh, here are some comments. Um, given Kyle Brink's recent comments about Dark Sun, I'd love to see the Radiant Citadel folks tackle a post-apocalyptic setting with diverse representation confronting climate crisis. Well, basically Dark Sun was. I mean, that's the thing. It, it, it kind of was. It was like a really dark fern gully. It was like you use magic, it's going to kill stuff, right? Uh, but you can use it if you want to, but it's going to kill stuff. Are you okay with that? If you're okay with it, then go ahead, man. Even the creators of Dark Sun have acknowledged that updates would be needed uh, to update the setting. Updates would be needed to update the setting, obviously. <laughs> In a recent interview with comicbook.com, Dark Sun co-creator Troy Denning said that I think if they reissued Dark Sun and asked me to do it, I'd want to take a very careful look at it and make sure that the stereotypes were not being used negatively and that we, we were avoiding stereotypes as much as possible. Proud of everything I did in Dark Sun, but that's not to say I couldn't do it better now. It's not gonna be Dark Sun. If you're gonna change it that much, it's not gonna be Dark Sun. So there we go, guys. Dark Sun is too problematic, too problematic for current year Wizards of the Coast. Uh, pretty soon it's gonna get to a point where, you know, Dungeons and Dragons is too problematic um, because, you know, dragons are violent and dungeons, that's where you keep slaves and we can't have that either. Uh, we don't want anybody to be imprisoned and people feel bad about cops. And that's like, it's just, it hits, hits, um, uh, too close to home. So we need to, we need to change the language. It's like, we have to be responsible. We have to be responsible with our fictitious fantasy setting. So Tumblr people aren't offended. So Twitter's not offended. So we don't get canceled. I honestly think at the end of the day, I don't think these guys actually feel this way. I think they know the audience they've cultivated and they're afraid of them. They're deathly afraid of them. I'm gonna wrap it up. Please subscribe for more pop culture news views and rants, guys. We'll talk later.